This one is reimagining education, so a mission to make the system work for all. And there's an increasing need to reconsider how children learn as new technologies and economic changes continue to impact education. And to make sure we get the most out of this panel discussion, we are going to welcome to the stage Hulia Kurt, co-founder of Inkick, who is going to be our moderator for this panel discussion. So a round of applause, please, for Hulia. Everyone, and I hope you can hear me, that's great. And I would like to let you imagine, imagine a bit about the ideal education system or the ideal learning system. How would that look like for you? If there were no limitations, there are no hurdles, everything is possible, how would that look like for you? Reimagining, like we can do whatever we want. We can have the kid, the young generation flourish, thrive, learn, experiment, fail, do it again and there is no exams or anything else. Before that, we had great, great discussions. Sorry? <laughs> no, not at all. That's our vision board, and that's what we discuss here during the education conference. You know, we have good, wonderful initiatives going on, really a bit in silos, as I could listen, but we need to do more. And we have got a long way. And that's why we as educators or any passionate person believing in human growth, supporting young people is thriving here. And that's why we're here for. And addressing them, raising awareness, like we had the panelists just before, really inspirational talk. I loved it, absolutely. That's what we would like to achieve. With that, who am I? Julia Kurt, absolutely. The founder of Inkick, Innovation Kick. So I kick you a bit to innovate yourself, you know, because this is what we need to do all the time. I'm a coach, business coach for professionals in midlife crisis. I'm also the managing director of Noble Manhattan Coach Training School. And I'm proud of our flagship product, which is really for educators, because we need to as well support our teachers so they can support as well the students and our young generation. With no further ado, I would like now to invite all our wonderful, amazing fellow panelists on stage to join me. So please come on stage. A round, big, big applause for all of our panelists. And whilst they are taking place, again, let's remind ourselves about the header. Reimagining education, a mission, a mission to make this work for all in the system that we have at the moment. Is it mission impossible? Maybe, maybe not. We don't want to jump out of the kind of skyscrapers like Tom Cruise does, of course, but we might need to really move the rocks. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to see you here on stage. It's an honor and a privilege and a wonderful opportunity to hear from the experts that we have here. And I'm sure I've introduced myself, but you would like to know as well who is with me discussing this wonderful, amazing, interesting topic. So with no further ado, I leave my wonderful panelists to introduce themselves quickly so you know who's talking. Is on? Yeah. Yes, it is. Hi, I'm Jennifer Williams. Um, I fulfill two roles right now. One is COO and Vice President of Aquinas International Academy. We are a K-12 accredited international school with students in over 20 countries. Um, what makes us unique is we do live sessions, uh, no more than six in a classroom, and it works really well. And one thing that I noticed, though, is 
you know, a, a lot of our students, their parents are pushing them towards university. And university isn't for everybody, right? I think there was a huge push for that several years ago and everybody was supposed to go to college and, and get a degree. Uh, but I think in the states, and I'm not positive about this number, but the dropout or I guess you could say 70, over 70% 70 of the students that start university don't finish, don't get their degree. Several that maybe have a marketing degree end up managing a restaurant. So, um, so kind of to, to combat some of that and what we're, what we're having in the states too is we're having a shortage of certain career, people to fill certain careers. Uh, trades being a big one, but there are there are several. So, uh, in reimagining education, I said, you know, we need to we need to be able to provide an education for everyone, right? So I started um, Virtual Career Institute International, and that is career-based training that leads to certifications. The other thing that we do is we have an international jobs board, so. We've kind of flipped the model a little bit from train to hire, to hire to train. So with internships um, around the world, and then students can, we can tailor their education, their training for that job that they want. One of the things that we started doing, and we're gonna do a free version in January, is a career discovery course. And this really needs to start down at grade six, grade five, and let's try to figure out passions of some of these students, figure out what, they're, what they love doing, what they're good at, and then encourage them and push them towards, towards that, um, you know, train them in, in that particular um, career path. So let's make the best use of the time. And um, I think most importantly is reimagining education, something that they said earlier is, you know, it. it it's ever evolving, right? We, we can't continue to put students in a box, like everybody has to learn this way. Um, and I love that about online learning because the teachers can, we can, we can do individualized learning plans for every student. Um, I think that's really important, so that's. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So we need to turn over to Donna. Hello. My name is Donna Chemka. I'm head of an international school in Bangkok called Ascot International. Ascot International is a three-program IB World School, but we're a school with a difference. We are an intentionally small school. We're a school situated in the suburbs of Bangkok. And what is completely unique is we are a school striving for inclusivity. And that sounds like a lofty goal, but it's something we've worked actively on for a number of years. So that our motto is that every child is seen and that it's our lifelong mission to ensure that they are. And that means challenging our own life experience, challenging our own bias, and ensuring that our children are immersed in an environment where no matter faith, religion, gender, sexuality, race, you name it, that we are trying to remove those layers. I'm certainly not sitting here saying we've got it solved, but it sits at the centre of what we do. And that means that we're working towards an environment that's safe for students and for staff. Education can be very much like an arms race and I think when you work in particularly international education where every enrolment is paying your salary and your staff salary, you really do have to shift your thinking to ensure that the environments we are creating are not perpetuating the same cycles of bias that have happened in past generations. So that's Ascot. And so when I think about reimagining education, it's about putting the learner at the centre of every decision, which sometimes is really difficult and it certainly doesn't make you a lot of money. But that for me is about re-educating, reimagining what education can be. Is everybody in our community seen and acknowledged? Thank you very much, Donna. That was really interesting. So let's turn over then to Navid. Thank you, Hulia. 
So my name is Navid Nazimian, and I have spent 26 years working for some of the world's most admired companies in the HR function. So I've always had a remit that included the learning, development, training, organization development. And um, I have turned my passion, which I was something that I was doing on the side, into my full-time activity. So I am now uh, a full-time executive coach, not an HR leader who does coaching on the side. And my take on our topic today is, uh, first off, I think if we want to reimagine education so that it works for everyone, we have to really get into this public-private partnership space. I have really enjoyed being a student myself many, many, many years ago to have practitioners to come in and complement what our professors used to teach us. Uh, it was fascinating to see how you can see the theory coming to life by having practitioners um, talking to you about how it actually works in practice. So that's the first thing. The second item, I think, is related to access. Uh, again, you know, I have been fortunate enough to have lived and worked in five countries uh, where education is uh, important, education is funded quite well, and generally accessible to the large majority of the population. But sadly, that is not the case everywhere we go. And so therefore, I think there is an angle to this that touches upon the topic of access and how can we make sure that every child has access to uh, proper and good education. The third aspect is related to funding. And again, I speak from experience when I say that I have um, a time seen you know, crisis coming our way as an organization. And guess what? The first budget that is being slashed is the training and development budget. And I think the same applies to many governments. If you look at how uh, sometimes governments are deprioritizing education over other topics that are also important, it's a shame. And this is something that definitely needs to be rejigged and reconsidered. And last but not least, I really believe that there is no way around having proper education without including the aspect around digital learning. I think, again, as much as a, as a parent, I don't like to have our son you know, being on his tablet or on a device uh, too, too much uh, any given day. There is no way out of this. And so we might find our peace with it and try to set boundaries and limitations and offer alternatives to that as well. And so that would be my uh, initial ideas about the topic. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this esteemed panel. I'm really, really looking forward to our conversation. Lovely, thank you so much. This interesting topic is coming up here slowly, slowly. I've got already some questions aligned, but of course we're going to continue with Zina. Hello everybody, um, my name is Zena Simmons. Um, I'm currently a UC Davis um, medical student in my third year, um, and I'm also an insurance broker. I have my own agency called ZLS Agency. Um, I went to Pepperdine for undergrad where I received my bachelor's of science. Um, I studied sports medicine and French, and I specialize in international studies, so I learned how to speak French and Spanish. I was abroad, I studied um, in places like Switzerland, Argentina. Um, I worked at a hospital in Argentina, and then um, I did a lot of mission work. I also um, identify as a missionary because I work in a lot of impoverished um, countries where we um, bring medical services and public health education um, to many villages, um, and not always just villages, but just a lot of different countries. Um, I don't want this to be about me, but <laughs> um, I'm just going um, into a few details so that I can kind of give an overview of, you know, why this type of work is important. Um, I also do policy work. Um, I was chair for a California Medical Association, so I lead all of the medical students in California um, and, you know, help people figure out what policy um, needs are necessary in terms of health care in our state. So I'm a huge believer of um, the effects that government and policy making has on um, healthcare and education as well. I see they kind of go hand in hand. Um, I view the education system as very similar to the healthcare system in ways, especially when you're taking a global approach. 
Um, I don't think you can take the most or the strongest healthcare system, right, and then have every country mimic that system because there is so much variation um, within the population, both within nations and between nations, right? So we have to specialize these systems to meet the need um, of the people that exist in each country. Um, and through that, we need awareness. We have to understand the needs of the people. Just like Navid said, you also need resources. Um, funding is important. And then also um, structure is really important. All of those things generally are the responsibility of the government and policymakers. Um, so it's very important that each government prioritizes education. Um, another very important factor is equity, right? We have to provide the people the resources that they need, but not just provide everybody with equal resources. We have to provide them with the resources that they specifically need, regardless of where they're starting, right? To ensure that everybody is successful because the more educated people are, the more skills they will have, and then they'll be able to positively contribute to each society. And then we could have happier, healthier um, societies and countries. I think another very important factor when we're discussing educational systems is just making sure that we're decreasing the barriers that exist. So we can have all of these great education systems put in place, right? But if people can't access them, um, if, say, you build the most amazing school across town, but people can't, or the students can't get to those schools because they don't have transportation, right, then they can't access them, and they are basically no good. So barriers are important. I think it's also very important to understand the effects that um, environment has, um, the importance of having um, healthy, safe environments for students to learn in, and that's generally the responsibility of the institutions, right? Educational institutions need to um, make sure to provide suitable environments for students to learn um, and flourish in. And um, like I said, a lot of that starts from a systems level where the government um, should be responsible for creating these structures um, for students to learn in. Thank you so much, Zina. This is really great. And we have got a very diverse panel here from all generations and from all sorts of backgrounds and experience. It's amazing. And we had a different view. I picked up on always on access, resources, funding. No, no one size fits all doesn't exist. So I'm picking up on little words and it's going to be very interactive afterwards. So let's hear from Bilal. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Bilal Shamut. I'm co-founder and CEO of Masarat. We have a stand outside if you want to talk to us afterwards. Masarat uh, is Arabic for pathways, um, and uh, uh, we specialize in big data analytics and insights for K-12 education. Um, and uh, the reason we called it pathways is because we use historical data that is ethically collect about every student um, uh, throughout their K-12 educational journey to provide them with their pathway in life, help, help them identify their pathway in life based on, on personalized data. And the topics I want to talk about are, are quickly three, three little topics. Uh, they are dear to my heart. I can speak for hours, but I won't bore you. Um, <clears throat> so the topics are the, the educational paradox, uh, the educational crisis, and the possible solutions. The paradox that we've identified is that if you look at government spending uh, year over year, uh, in most governments around the world, every year the government spending on education goes up. And that's mainly driven by uh, uh, public perception about the quality of education not being good enough to meet societal needs. Uh, so the governments are spending more and more money on education. The paradox is that all this money is going to the educators who are uh, and policymakers who are making sure that education is improving, and the proof is in that the quality of education is improving. It's, it's, it's really, I mean, what we learned in school when we were in school is not what is being taught today, and it's not being taught in the same way either. So there is considerable improvements, yet public perception that drives 
government policy is that it's not good enough. So that's the paradox, is what's, what's going on here. Uh, which brings us to the crisis, uh, uh, the educational crisis, which is <clears throat> if you trace back the roots of all educational systems around the world, <clears throat> you can trace it back to about 200 years ago, in the early days of the industrial, first industrial revolution. And this is how those uh, uh, um, school systems were, were, were first originated, and, and they were designed to fulfill the requirements and the demands of the first industrial revolution. Problem is, today we live in the fifth industrial revolution. So what our school systems are producing is not meeting today's requirements and, and demands uh, and values. Um, and this is where, where the paradox is. This is where the gap is. And the, re the reason this is a crisis is because there was an interesting study that was published back in 2017 by the Institution, uh, the, the institution for the Future uh, about the impact of technology on future society. And it made several important, uh, the scope of the study was, was by 2030, which is just eight years from now. And, and the, the, uh, the, they came up with uh, a few interesting findings. One of them is that by 2030, 85% of the technology jobs that will exist then have not yet been invented. Okay? So how can we be possibly teaching our, our children today any skills or, or, or information that, about, that will help them take those jobs in the future? <clears throat> the second um, important discovery was that uh, by 2030, the, uh, 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 the job market is going to switch into a more uh, of a gig economy, uh, where uh, and and the job is going to be seeking the worker instead of the worker seeking the job, um, and and uh, that's happening already. It's uh, it's starting. So the problem is how do we bridge this gap? How do we go from first industrial revolution values and, and, and requirements to fifth re industrial revolution. And our thesis is that we do it by data. We do it and we have to start collecting the data today so that and we have to collect the right data today so that we can analyze it, we can figure out what, where the gaps are and how to bridge those gaps. So, Wow, Bilal, so it's about data. We hear data, uh, again, technology systems that need to work for us so that we can actually figure out how we can support our young generation for future professions, which do not exist at the moment, which is also very interesting. So nice, thank you very much, Bilal. And last but not least, Mario. Yeah, yeah good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me. This is an honor. I'm Dr. Mario Chiasso. Uh, I'm from the East Coast in Brunswick, Canada, where that we've got about 10 inches of snow. So I'm so happy to be here. Uh, so uh, my job is that I got a dual role. I got the director of uh, research, innovation, and change management. I would call consider evolution management, uh, but also I'm an associate professor at University of Moncton there in New Brunswick, uh, Canada. Uh, when I was asked to be part of this panel, there was two words that were really resonating with me. Uh, with his title, it was the first one and the last one, reimagining all. And I think my colleague there, I know, yeah, I think he's right on the money uh, uh, of doing that. So basically, like you know, the profound questions asked is, what's the role of the school as part of the evolution of of humanity? Uh, understand that we're in the fifth or in the fourth. There's a lot of arguments about that, depending where you, you you're coming from. So starting with that is that I was here a couple of years ago. And uh, it was quite interesting at this conference, but I got this guy there called uh, Thomas L. Freeman. And his first, his first slide was that you can't be an educator and educate student if you don't know how the world works. And that was a profound question. He asked, how many of you knows? Right? And nobody was capable of doing that. So that, came, that became a challenge for me. So I kind of kind of studied that, how the world works, right? Okay, this, and so we can understand the mismatch about you know, the, the formal education format and the, inno the challenge of the innovative society. And the profound question is that we, we, we're facing the two challenges, is that our societies you know, is living in the VUCA period, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that is increasing at a fast rate. So now that's becoming say, how societies are adapting to the new humanity, all right, okay? The second question is how that the school system can adapt, adjust, and adopt as evolve. 
So knowing the fact that the society is as evolving faster, right? The school system's asking this question, where are we? So it's becoming stagnant. So now we're facing with double challenge. So the school system now we need to say, okay, how do I make sure that the three R are respected and the abilities like, you know, that needs to be developed that we don't know of, okay, we need to prepare. That's what we're challenged with, like the profound question. So the question is, do we need school? So find a study that, when we study that is that, yeah, it's a profound question per, per se because it's going philosophical, right? Okay, this is that there's a mismatch and this mismatch about the challenge of innovative societies and the, the formal education system that is, there's no one element. There's actually five, right? Okay, this is the first one is the evolution of ICT. The second one is the evolution of the economy. The first, the third one is the evolution of automations. The third one is the evolution of environments. And the fourth one is the evolution of leadership. So those five elements, I could argue that it's explained about the mismatch uh, of doing that. So we're currently living a Promethean moment. And a Promethean moment is that there's some story or some technology that's happening that's not changing one thing, but change everything. So instead of the world speaking this way, we're turning this way, it's actually turning this way. And we don't know how that thing works yet. Okay, so we're in the midst of transitioning to a industry to another type of industry. Okay, this. I'll give you an example about the evolution of the economy. So for 1492 to 1820, the evolution of the economy was working by countries or royalties. From 1820 to 2007, right, okay, this, the major, uh, the, was, the economy was controlled and managed by major firms. But since 2007, the appearance with big data, which gave the birth of smart of AI, okay, this, this, new, this, this new branding can occur. And we don't know how that thing works yet, even though there's five type of AI uh, with this. So before the digital industry, right, okay, this, the role of the education was producing workers, right, this. But now, okay, since the digital industry, is that this now transform and shift to develop entrepreneurs. And having the entrepreneurial mild, mindset is one of the three pillars now of the education system. Unfortunately, yes or no, we can argue, but it's one. The second one is the arts, because all arts build creativity. And I think that as we move forward, I think that's the only thing that will belongs to us. Because everything that's gonna be sequel is gonna be replaced by AI and autumn artificial intelligence and smart robots and and I want to deep dive on that. So uh, we have a time, it's a time there to redesign, to redefine what is learning and not what is teaching or what is education, but what is learning, right, uh, about this. Just this whole notion of, of personal mindset and we talk about a lot of personalization and uh, that's resonate a, a lot because in the role of the schools is to provide you know, a great citizen capable of contributing to the innovative society, right? Okay, this, and therefore, the system needs to work, and they can't, be, they can't do this alone. So we need to transform the ego system, the ego education system, to an echo community. And the echo community is the synergy and the interdependent and the, real, and the dependence of the K-12, but K-20 schools, municipalities, Economy, uh, the communities and the health. And that's the new system that we need to evolve now. So this echo community will be the foundation, I do believe that you know, that's gonna be responding collectively when we're talking about a dynamic collaborative uh, culture, it's the relationship about those three components supported, supported by research, supported by collaborative with unions, and also the profound working there with the governments. And I think those six components is gonna be able to revolutionize the education system that we so desperately need. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. This is really great insights. And when I hear about all the wonderful experts which have shared their, their feed forward, I would say, because these comments make us or puts us one step ahead, it's amazing. So I heard a lot about collaboration as well. We can't do it on, a, on our own. Like my motto from Union Comes Strength, partnerships. We had that in the first day, which was really great. I love that. Policy, policy making. 
that where it starts actually if you want to have that big cruise ship working and, and steering towards a good direction. Lots of about resources as well, access the main thing, the, the kind of Maslow's pyramid, you know, how can, how can students get access? Absolutely amazing. So before we jump on the kind of question, I want to ask something else because I'm a bit, you know, results oriented as well. So yeah, so kind, what do you think needs to happen? What would be first steps or one step ahead that would bring us, you know, towards a better, how shall I say, improved learning experience, you know? What, what do you think? Anyone can take the microphone. Jennifer. I think we go to the source. We go to the students and we find out what that is. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time creating certain programs and things like that. What I have found is when I go directly to the students, and that's, that's where you have to start. The teachers that deal with the students on a daily basis, go there, right? I don't think we need governments deciding anything about education. Um, the, the bureaucracy gets a little overwhelming and we forget about student success. And they're the best ones to tell us what they need. Student wants, they wanna learn differently. They don't wanna learn the way we did. And we have to adapt to that. I love that. Get, get real insight from the students, from the people, from the humans who are impacted, right? Thanks, Jennifer. Yes, Donna. And I think it's about redefining the purpose of education. Early childhood is not a preparation for primary school. High school is not a preparation for university. Education is preparation for life. It is life. And I think, unfortunately, so many of our clientele, our parents, they all went to school. They were successful at school. Therefore, why change it? Yet we have to help, as you said, look to the future. When I started teaching, a wonderful educator said to me, imagine 2000, and that seemed like a very long time ago, what sort of things are your children going to be able to know, do and understand? And it blew me out of the... It just changed the way I see education. And for parents, they want their children to be successful. But what is success defined as? And that, I think, is the big change for me, is what is the purpose of what we're doing? What are we preparing our kids for? Lovely, I like that. The why, the famous why. In anything that we do, we always have a why. And if the purpose is lost, our, our direction is lost. Thank you so much, Donna. Anyone else? I think, yeah, prepared already. Navid, go ahead. Yes, first off, I wholeheartedly agree with what my fellow panelists have shared so far. I would like to pick up on something that Bilal mentioned earlier, which is applying a data-driven approach. And I would like to share a concrete example, again, from my work as a human resources practitioner. In one of my previous companies, we used to have a very prestigious leadership development program. This program had been designed with one of the most famous um, universities that is famous for executive education in, in London, in the UK. And we had spent a mini fortune, you know, de defining, designing that program. And it had the highest net promoter score rating. So participants who went through the program, I think the lowest we ever had was a 93, which, you know, as if you work in the HR function, you get a 93 for anything you do, you would be a very happy man or woman. Now, when I came into my role, I started digging into the actual data and not the data necessarily relates to what is the satisfaction with this training course, but really, what is the outcome of this, right? Now, this program, bear in mind, was set up with a very particular focus, which was to fast track middle managers into senior leadership roles, right? Okay, so let's look at what is the actual products, what is the actual outcomes of this? And believe it or not, and I had to hire a data scientist to help me with this exercise. And what we found out, because again, the, the, the issue you have in any large corporate is you don't have, you have lots of data, but you don't necessarily have access to the right set of data the way you like to have it. And so the data scientists helped us as a project team to look into that. And what we found out is, and believe it or not, over a course of seven years, this is as as far as we could go back into having reliable data to base our decision going forward on, we had three individual cases of promotions. 
of which two had already left the company and one was still working there. Now imagine we spend over a million pounds per year on this very fancy, expensive program. And this is what, where I would like to circle back on if we had one lever to pull, if we had one shot to make, where would we put the money behind? I think it should be a data-driven approach, right? Don't try to copy and paste a, a, a successful model into a new country or into a new education system. Go to the data points and the data will give you the right insights in order so you can design and develop from there. Wow, lovely. So I heard data, facts, facts and figures, and someone who can make sense out of these facts and figures. Because facts and figures, you know, you give me a chart, I wouldn't understand anything. Someone needs to explain to me what I need to do here, right? So that's good. Therefore, I would like to turn, sorry, Zina, to actually Bilal, because it's about data. What do you think? Or you give yeah. the word to Zina, that's fine as well. Well, okay. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Are you sure? So um, I agree with what everybody else said. I think that um, a lot of it has to do with curriculum development, um, really studying different students and understanding the different ways that um, various students learn. I think there's always a lot of expectations put on students to constantly adjust to different teaching styles, which could be multiple times a day, right? If you have multiple lectures, different professors, and they all teach differently. Um, as a student, you already have a lot of responsibility to absorb as much material as you possibly can. As a medical student, it's like information overload all the time, right? So that's your main priority. Um, but if you have a lot of other responsibilities, like experiential learning is important, right? We wanna prioritize that. Um, and make sure students are doing extracurriculars as well. Those are all responsibilities. If you're having to adjust to different teaching styles, that takes effort. Um, and it takes away from the time that students um, can actually, excuse me, actually absorb material. So if we can create curriculums, you know, develop curriculums that can meet students where they are and um, meet different uh, learning styles, then I think we could see a lot um, of improvements in outcomes and learning outcomes specifically. Yeah, uh, thank you. And back to the point about, about data. <clears throat> so, and, and we're talking about massive amounts of data. We're not talking about, you know, the, the top level data. We need, we need to dig deeper into, the, into this. So imagine, forget higher education. Let's focus on K-12 for now. Um, and imagine the, all the quizzes, tests, and homework assignments and exams that we have all done throughout our K-12 journey, right? It's a massive number, okay? Across all subjects, of course, and, and so on. Now imagine every question on these assessments, okay? Every one of these questions that we've ever answered measures a specific learning outcome and our attainment level of that learning uh, outcome. And it's carefully designed to measure a certain cognitive skill in our head, right? Where is this data now? Vanished, <laughs> evaporated, because nobody's collecting. Nobody's capturing this data. These are valuable data points that we can use. We can use to uh, analyze in real time and provide insights to the educators as well as the learners and who are the stakeholders in, in education, who are, whomever they may be, okay? So to, to drive informed data-driven decisions in real time about what needs to change now, okay? What is our next lesson plan? What is our next assessment plan? And, and so on. And this can be done, okay? Uh, a few years ago, the technology to do this wasn't practical or feasible, but now it is, okay? Um, and all of these data points collected over all these years of, of education can be very informative to, this, to the learner themselves. I mean, look, with most high school graduates until today, most high school graduates graduate, they get their diploma, and they're happy and they're excited, okay, and now they're lost. They have no idea what to do for the rest of their lives, right? Um, 
and in the U.S., some, some uh, statistics, uh, up to 30% uh, in the U.S. drop out within the first year in college, right? Um, and 80% uh, of the remaining students end up changing their majors at least once, which increases the time and the cost of obtaining a four-year college degree. Okay? The average four-year college degree takes 4.8 years to accomplish. And 61% and of college graduates with a degree say that if they had the option, they, can, they would go back and choose a different major. Okay? Now, if you think about it, every single one of these students has been measured, tested, and assessed in every possible way for the previous 12 years of their lives. And they've certainly passed all the standardized assessments that were required of them. And most likely, they've received and acted upon guidance counseling. Yet, this problem exists. But we, we had the data for them. We had the data to, to tell them. So great. So I wow. hear data, I hear technology, use the systems that we have at hand to assess first facts and figures and also get human, human feedback, feed forward. I call it Mario. Uh, yes. Uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. My God, lots of passion oh, here. I can, you guys feel the energy here? <laughs> I feel it here in a way. This. Uh, great, great story. So yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll take the data, and I think I'm going back to the original question. What would be the simplest thing to do, right? Okay, like you, to 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 me, is it right? Okay, engagement, but system engagement, right? By em empowering every learners, and when I'm talking about every learners, not only the learner itself, everyone, because everybody is a learner now in the digital industry. So how you can take data, which is dynamic, static data that tells the story, and the, for, from my understanding, the story is becoming four elements. You need to go to passive pedagogy to active pedagogy. You need to take the system leadership 2.0, the current system leadership 2.0, which is probably one of the main reasons why that our learning culture is still driven down, top down. You need to go now to a leadership 4.0, which is basically nurturing a dynamic collaborative culture within and without the community at school internationally. Right, this. The fourth element is the culture. If you want to measure something about the data, is the culture. The culture, a healthy culture. How do you measure healthy? How do you measure engagement culture? How do you measure like, you know, the, the, uh, the healthy, but the, the relationship between? Because we know students, the first thing they go to school is to relate with a teacher, right? Okay, there's that build confidence. And once you have that build that confidence, the student build self-management. And when you build self-management, self-decision. When you self-decision, he's developing autonomy, right? So if you want to measure that, it's very. And the fourth one, in my opinion, is one of the fourth element, is a sense of community. The school is a community. So the first one is pedagogy, leadership, culture, and community. If you want to play with data, Let's play with this data that can tell that story. And I think you'll have a system transformation instead of pocket of silos that try, that tries to Abs evolve. Thank absolutely. You. And, and I think when you look at the talk and the pedagogical talks around learner agency, that's exactly what we're talking about. My daughter is, is in her 20s now, but when she was finishing high school, we sat down and it was a student-teacher conference and we were the observers. I didn't like that very much. I was paying for those school fees. But it was a fascinating experience for me. She was just 18 and her teacher said, right, what do you know? What do you need to know for the next exam block coming up? How can I support you? And in every subject area, she sat and she shared with the teachers where she felt confident. She had these strong, rich dialogues about herself as a learner. And as we walked outside, I looked at it and I said, it doesn't matter what marks you get. You're educated. You know yourself. You know your strengths. You know your challenges. You can talk more articulately about these things and you don't see next steps as a deficit. Money well spent and well done. And it was such a glorious experience to, to see this very strong-willed young lady actually be an active participant in her learning experience. And I think that's an example of exactly what you're talking about. 
Lovely. Thank you very much for this wonderful story. That helps. As a moderator, I've got a tough as well uh, duty, which is to make sure that we are on time. I've got a wonderful clock in front of me. So I'm just looking at it. And the conversation can go in forever here. You know, I mean, we are so passionate about the topic itself. However, I would like, if you allow me, dear panelists, to look in the audience and see if we have any questions for our wonderful experts here on stage. Please pick up the microphone. You can ask immediately. Otherwise, I've got lots of questions in my pocket. Lovely, please. Yeah, here it is. Thank you. First of all, thank you for an absolutely lovely panel discussion here. I was really passionate in listening to you. Uh, there's something wrong with the microphone, I think. Uh, maybe I could have another one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot about me, I think. So thank you. This one works much better. I got really stuck on something here. Someone here said, because I was sitting uh, you know, after the food here, it's not any longer that you look for a job, the job will come to you. Yeah? And the reason I got stuck with that is because I work as a career leadership coach and I work with PhDs, uh, transforming them for a career beyond the academic context. And that means you have to change the mindset, you have to start to look at your transferable skills, etc. And what I struggle a lot with, and I developed something that I call an agile job search, that means headhunt your dream job, you know? Headhunt your dream job. So you headhunt your dream job. And I have a really hard time with PhDs, and particularly if they stayed a very long time and they are postdocs. Because the thing is, they look for a job and they say, yeah, I find a job, but I don't think I like it. And then I say, yeah, but you have to look the other way around. You have to start to use the algorithm and the AI, and you have to start to write down and find the skills for things that you love to do. So you feed the machines with things you love to do. And for me, I think that that's obvious, but I really struggle with particularly PhDs and postdocs that stayed very long time in academic context to see the difference between love to do and can do. And I can take hours of coaching, you know, you know, connecting brain and heart and stomach and everything, not can do, love to do. And I like to hear from you, what is it, what happened on the way from a master student dreaming to a pe from a master student, because they are dreaming and they have no problem to say what they love to do because, oh yeah, blah, 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 you know, it goes on for half an hour. And then you do a PhD. And the longer you stay, suddenly it's much more can do. And I have two big eyes when I said, I know you can do, but I would like to hear what you love to do. So you feed the system with that. I like to hear some comments around that because I believe we need to change the academic context here. Something happened on the way. Thank you so much for that question. So I turn around to the wonderful panelists here. I think Jennifer's already turned <laughs> immediately on it. I'm yes. Always, yes. <laughs> because my. My big thing is, you know what, find their passion and what you're talking about. And going through all this education and then, you know, you, you're, you think you love it, but you can't do it type thing. And I'm hearing, you know, push towards entrepreneurship. Not everybody is an entrepreneur, and that's okay. Not everybody is a leader, and that's okay. But that's what we need to start finding out early on so that we can guide these students. I tell my teachers all the time, we don't really need teachers, we need coaches and mentors. Kids are gonna teach themselves, but we need to teach them and coach them as to where to go for the right information and how to apply it. That's gonna be the best benefit to them. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Anyone else? Chipping in? Oh, you want to go ahead? I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I think in my opinion, um, sometimes uh, when people go from like loving what they're doing, right, as a bachelor's student, a master's student, and then become a doctorate student or actually start working as a professional, um, and now it's more of what they can do, sometimes it's associated with the stress that's affiliated with the job, right? Because the responsibility is so much higher at that point, the stakes are higher, and then 
I know every country is different when it comes to financing education, but in the US, education is very expensive. So by the time you're a doctorate student, you owe, you owe a lot of loans. So if somebody wants to change their profession, they're kind of stuck in it. Um, so now it's like, you know, I can't even modify my journey because, you know, I committed so much to this. So um, like I said, also once they start working under institutions and you're not really like being catered to as much as students, um, you're kind of, the schools work for you. Once you're working, or even a doctorate student, you're working for the institution, it becomes more stressful, and now people are just kind of pushing through. Not everybody, but some people. As you so what you say, they move into a stress mode, and that blocks, because mm -hmm. that is what I believe, yeah. sort of. Yeah, <laughs> so you start to lose the side of the view, but I'm happy to hear that you're on the same track here. So thank you for your just, question. Just a moment, just a moment. I'm just checking the time, so thank you very much. Um, just to interrupt, I'm sorry. Um, is there any other questions that maybe any other panelists can and will answer? There is one more in the audience because we want to have some interaction. We had already the response, so let's see what will be the question here. Yes, please. Thank you for the lovely panel question. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I really felt the passion in you guys about education. I really loved the discussion. Um, because I'm in the also in the special education field, when we look at big data and we want to prioritize and measure what education should be, there's, you know, amongst teachers, some people believe in inclusive education and some people want to differentiate you know, differentiate these people. Because, you know, for some people, the education might be good, and for some, it wouldn't be good. And that's looking, and I think that's looking at data as well. But maybe the assessment we do, because, you know, when well, humans measure, like the, well, we, we might ask the artificial intelligence to come up with some other assessment priority, but I don't know how that is possible yet. So I, I, I don't know what the question is now, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that was a comment, and thank you for the comment, though. <laughs> but I think someone is already, you know, Donna, please. Diversity isn't easier, okay? But what we know is when people, students, humans are exposed to a variety of provocations, we rise and we're inspired. And so, for me, it's worth the effort. Thank you so much. And I look at the wonderful watch which says, your time is up. We can discuss for hours here. Again, every one of the panelists are available for you in the, in the breakout rooms, like outside and for the networking after the conference is finished. I really thank you from my heart for your engagement, for your wonderful, passionate, you know, insights. It was really great. And with that, we close Reimagine Education, how the system should work for all. Because if we say all, we mean inclusivity. Inclusive means everyone included, whatever you are, whoever you are, what type of human you are. And that's what the learning experience should be. With that, closing remarks. Thank you so much. And we shall hand over to a wonderful host. Thank you.